Okay, hi guys. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to your class. I think this is a, a great opportunity to get to come and um, have a chat about a bit about myself and my marine science background and then our um, lovely topic for today on ecotourism and the reasons and rules around ethical management of human interactions with some of our marine fauna. So I am going to start with giving you a bit of a brief, a bit of a brief back background about myself. Um, my currently, I'm work in the marine science program at the Department of Biodiversity Conservation and Attractions, and I also have some involvement and work with WAMSI as well. But I'll just give you a bit of a brief bio about my little, my little journey and how I got to be where I am in the world of marine science. Um, so how did I get here? I was lucky enough to start out my early life living in a small beach town community in Southern California. So it means I got to spend a lot of my free time down at the beach, hanging around tide pools, you know, playing in the surf and all of that. Uh, it gave me a big love of the ocean and, and certainly of, of an interest in marine science. When I started at high school, I had some of my first biology classes and that kind of did it for me. I always knew I would be a scientist and given my, um, you know, kind of marine background and interest, marine biology seemed like the thing for me. So I went away to university with that plan. I went to a, a university in uh, kind of central California, University of California at Santa Cruz. And I got exposed to a few new ideas and interesting things there that I hadn't I hadn't experienced before in the science world, mainly things like animal behavior and then also field research. And being at that university, uh, we had a lot of exposure to that teachers that were interested in those those kind of topics and a lot of graduate students who would take you out to volunteer on their own research projects. So I got exposed to things like studying killer whales in Canada and working with elephant seals in Santa Cruz. And that just kind of furthered my journey in knowing what I wanted to do. I then took a bit of a gap year after finishing my undergrad degree and um, went as a backpacker to travel around Australia for a year and still continue to get involved in volunteer work with, with marine animals where I could. So I spent some time up at Monkey Maya in Shark Bay working with the dolphin researchers there. And then I also spent some time in New Zealand working on a boat um, that took people out to swim with dusky dolphins. So I pretty much knew from then on that I wanted to keep going with this kind of work, sticking with marine mammals and, and biology and um, uh, understanding their behavior. But I also got a lot of a stronger interest in conservation and started thinking about what else can we do to start using our, our science to make a difference. I had an opportunity to do a PhD project, which lucky for me brought me back to Australia. And that project was working on the Atlantis Marine Park release of the captive dolphins when the Marine Park closed down back in the um, late 1980s. Now, that was another new experience for me. I actually was still at an American university, but I did all of my research and work back here in, um, in Perth. Again, it was a new experience. It was looking at um, some new issues around dolphins and, and biology and marine biology. And that was thinking about some of the ethical concerns and animal welfare issues for some of the for these animals and how we how we treat them in a release program. We've taken them into captivity, they're under our care, and now we're releasing them back out into the wild. And so what are the, some of the things we need to pay attention to? So kind of putting all those things together, my interest in the marine environment, animal behavior, ethical issues, conservation, I started then looking for jobs after finished my PhD. And once again, lucky enough, got to move back to Australia. And I got to be in a position where I could start using science to be making a conservation difference, which was what was really important to me. I spent about six years working for the National Parks and Wildlife Service in New South Wales, and I was working there on wildlife management. I was a coordinator of wildlife management in that role. And again, I got to work with a lot of marine issues, but also non-marine issues. So wildlife management is really about looking at that human wildlife interaction and interface. So it can be everything from swooping magpies, possums in your roof, to also dealing with uh, incident response, like a, a dealing with um, whale strandings, and also giving advice and helping to manage things like whale watching. So again, it's really looking at where those interactions between people and wildlife occur. Sometimes it's a conflict, sometimes it's helping, but always we're trying to keep conservation in mind. So after spending about six or seven years in New South Wales, I thought it was um, time to move back to Western Australia, which is a place I've always loved and wanted to return to. And again, was lucky, lucky enough to get to come back here in 2007 and take up a position in the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions. Now, our government department has changed names several times. It used to be Conservation and Land Management and then Environment and Conservation. And now this is our current title. But I've worked for this department since pretty much around 2007 in the marine science program. 
So my role here has been mainly about doing science coordination. So while I do get to go out and do some field research, I do spend a lot of time coordinating research that's being done by others, giving advice and assisting in projects and helping to set priorities and also probably one of the biggest parts of my role that I really do enjoy is doing that interpretation of the science and things that we're learning out there and making sure we can apply it to um, to our management and to conservation outcomes. So those are kind of some of the big things that are a part of my role at the moment um, that I that I am enjoying. Now, I think I'm also going to just give you just a bit of an overview about my department and what our department does. And then this will, of course, feed right into our discussion on ecotourism. So the Department of Biodiversity, Conservation and Attractions is our the state government department that's responsible for um, conservation of biodiversity in the state. So that's that's basically the remit and that's the legislation that we implement for the state. Basically, our main mission is to promote biodiversity and conservation to enrich people's lives through sustainable management of WA species, ecosystems, lands, and the attractions in the department's care. And so those attractions include things like Rottnest Island, the zoo, the botanic gardens. But then also we have to think about the attractions being that those natural landscapes and areas that we that we all protect with our with our natural biodiversity. One of the key things that's been very important to me about our department is that we believe in evidence-based decision-making, and that means there's a really large role for science. So, you know, we, we know what's out there that's important. We do our best to understand it. We do our best to understand the pressures on it, and then we use that information to decide and to best manage for the future. Now, like I said, I'm within the Marine Science Program, and so the role of the Marine Science Program as 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 our part of our um, position within the department, we're in the Division of Biodiversity and Conservation Science. So there's a, there's a range of different science areas for the whole state, which includes a lot of terrestrial threatened species and other areas. And the Marine Science Program is the one that focuses on marine. So in terms of our marine management, we have protected areas. The marine, there are a range of marine parks all throughout the state that you can see all the way from the Kimberley um, through Ningaloo, Shark Bay, and then down around the Perth, Metro, Jurian Bay, and Nari Capes as well. So we have a lot of marine protected areas. And my, oops, ah, oops, go back up. Um, my role in the department is assisting in the marine, uh, the research, the marine science program is that we ensure that the research and monitoring to inform management of those marine reserves and threat and fauna is undertaken. So within my group, we have a range of scientists with expertise in things like seagrass, corals, fish, marine turtles, other benthic type habitats, and then of course, marine mammals. So feeding this into ecotourism now, because as I've said, my department does um, pay attention to not only protecting our resources, but also making sure they're sustainably enjoyed. Now, this is where the ecotourism comes in. So ecotourism generally is a type of tourism that's both environmentally friendly and educational, and it focuses on the conservation of natural resources and protection in the environment, but also providing locals with opportunities for su su sustainable economic opportunities. So this is just a basic definition. Always got to start with the definition of um, what ecotourism actually is. And this is based, this is just came directly from the IUCN. So environmentally responsible visiting of relatively unspoiled areas in order to enjoy and appreciate nature and any accompanying cultural features, both past and present, that promotes conservation, has low negative visitor impact, and provides for beneficially active socioeconomic involvement of local populations. So some of the key things about ecotourism to, um, to keep in mind, it's definitely about having a natural experience. It's about being low impact so that we're not creating any few further problems for the environment. And it's also about being sustainable. And that means both environmentally and economically. So I'm going to talk about some of the marine ecotourism in WA and basically mainly around three of the um, kind of biggest marine fauna ecotourism situations that occur because those are the ones I have the most um, experience with. And these ones are going to be swimming with humpback whales in Ningaloo, feeding dolphins in Monkey Maya, and swimming with whale sharks also in Ningaloo. So I'm hoping that at least some of you have had some of these kinds of experiences out there in your past and you have might even know, um, have at least had, uh, had a chance to participate in some of these things. I'll ask you later. Okay, so first of the 
questions is why do we manage? Why is it important to actually make sure there's management programs and things around some of these ecotourism activities? And, you know, generally when you think about it, where ecotourism, ecotourism starts to occur, it's it's being done as a tourism product. So we're um, creating a situation, creating something that people are going to want to do. And that means there's going to be more and more people, as they hear about it, that start also wanting to become involved. So we need to make sure that as we kind of increase the popularity of these activities and increase what's happening, that it's not going to be having any impacts on the environment that we're trying to protect. So in terms of looking at marine fauna ecotourism, one of the first things we need to be looking at is, are there any impacts to the animals? Now, these can be things like direct impacts, like injury. So again, when we're looking at um, things like uh, where we're with marine animals, boat strike would be would be one that you would have to consider. Now, again, here's a picture of a whale shark that has does have a boat strike scar on it. Does not mean that that happened during an ecotourism event. I'm just using that as an example to just show that injury can't direct injury can occur in terms of when we're looking at ecotourism and with, when we're involving wildlife. Other things that we need to think about are, are we changing the animal's behavior and are we having some kinds of short-term effects? And then do these short-term effects lead to long-term effects? So we do know that things like whale watching and dolphin watching do affect animals' behavior. So anytime boats are approaching dolphins or whales, those animals will some change their behavior. They might stop an activity they were doing. They might start swimming in a different direction. Sometimes they'll come over and approach a boat. Sometimes they'll try and avoid. But it is having a short-term effect on their actual behavior. Now, what are the long-term implications of this? Say we're stopping animals from foraging. If that's happening routinely, does that mean that they're not going to be end up eating enough and it's going to have long-term health consequences? Are we disrupting group functions so that animals aren't spending time, um, time in the same kind of social interactions that they should be? So those are the kind of things we need to take into consideration when we're looking at the impacts for animals. Some of you may have been aware of a recent documentary that on the monkey my dolphins on the ABC called um, is our dolphins is our love too deep and again this is looking at when things are not regulated and there's um, interactions are starting to occur that it can start to have an impact so one of the important things from the monkey my dolphin situation that we learned very early on because there was a group of researchers that were out there collecting information so back in the 1980s um, when feeding the dolphins at monkey my was not regulated it became started becoming more and more popular. More people were going up there and the dolphins were just pretty much being fed, not constantly, but there would just be people around quite often and the dolphins were being fed more than was probably good for them. Researchers actually started to notice that this seemed to be having an impact on them in the sense that there was they started seeing more aggressive behavior in the dolphins. And they also noticed that the female dolphins, the calf mortality for the female dolphins was generally pretty high, certainly higher than the wild population. Our, my department became aware of that and started to put in place ways to manage and regulate how the dolphins were fed. Since that time, things have changed very much and it's been a well-regulated and well-managed program since that time. So this is where we start to look at, we're identifying impacts, we're looking at what the effects are and we're thinking about how we can manage. One of the important things to consider in there is individual animal wealth first, so sometimes which is about their animal welfare, as opposed to looking at population level impacts, which is more about conservation of a species or a population. Now, other things we need to consider when we're looking at why do we manage is the risk to people. Certainly, any kind of human wildlife interaction involves risk to people. So you put the ones where you're swimming with a humpback whale and a whale shark, you're putting yourself in the water with very large, very strong, and can be unpredictable. We don't always know where they're going to go or what they're going to be doing. You have a situation, especially with humpback whales, where there's mothers and, and calves, and a, and a mother might be feeling very protective of her calf. So can put it, be putting people into situations that are somewhat risky. Even whale watching has its own risks. Whales have been known to be breaching or other ways otherwise active uh, in an area around boats and have occasionally landed on boats. So there are definitely risks to people when they do try and come into close contact with wildlife. So we need to be aware of those and see how we can manage that. 
And finally, some of the other main reasons for what we do with management and why we look at managing is making sure that we are getting some of those positive outcomes from ecotourism. And that's things like promoting conservation. Again, if, if part of ecotourism, the value of it is making sure that people become more aware of the environment, appreciate it more, well, we want to make sure those messages are getting out there. And of course, the final one is about sustainability and economic, and that's financial and economic reasons as well. So to have a sustainable industry that's actually bringing financial benefits into a community or into an area is one of the other key factors of ecotourism that we need to make sure that we're maintaining. Okay, so now how do we go about doing all of this management that we're talking about? Well, Ecotourism has been around for a bit. There are a number of different types of ecotourism all around the world, and there's a number of different management tools that have been used in, in very different areas. So there's no one solution to everything. Every situation is going to have its own local circumstances, local communities, and local reasons and ways for why things are done. But there's a bunch of and management tools that are out there is just kind of a toolkit that, that can be considered and evaluated and used in different ways. So some of these things include um, everything from legislation and regulations to even voluntary codes of conduct. And so those are ways about setting about how, how operations or how interaction should occur. Licensing is often used as a means of managing um, ecotourism because this is a way of being able to set numbers and set caps on uh, and restrictions around how many people and how many interactions can occur. Zoning and time closures are also pretty commonly used because these, again, are ways of ensuring that where interactions with animals are occurring, that the animals have a chance to have a break. So whether there's zones or areas where activities occur or don't occur, it means there's always somewhere the animals could go to basically have a timeout. And the same with time closures. Um, it either gives animals an opportunity to have time away, and it also might make um, might be used for timing of say critical behavior. So during the breeding season or um, calving season, when you think animals might be more vulnerable, sometimes you'd put a closure around having activities not occurring during that time. So, you know, you, we consider what the things are that need to be mitigated and use these strategies to help with that. Marine protected areas are another similar one in that sense. So one of the key things to do when you looking at these management tools and considering what's going to be used based on the circumstances is making sure that all of the right people are involved in those decisions. So there's going to be a number of stakeholders that are involved in ecotourism activities, and that's going to be everything from the, the government representatives, uh, often conservation organizations, the tour operators themselves, and members of the local community and local areas. So this is a range of different stakeholders that might all have a different perspective, but definitely all have a shared interest in the activity and really need to be included and taken along for, for the ride, basically, in developing a management program and making sure it runs properly. So let's start with some of the things that we do in WA and how we are dealing with this management. We do have legislation and regulations here. We have the Biodiversity Conservation Act and the associated regulations. Now, in that act, we set out very clear minimum approach distances for marine mammals and also for whale sharks. And these basically a boat cannot go closer than 100 meters from from the sides of an animal and the 300 meters in front or behind. And this is things that's to ensure that you're not blocking off where they want to go or feeling like you're chasing behind them. And the 100 meters is just is a reasonable distance to be close enough to an animal without having an impact on it. The legislation also covers things like no feeding and no direct harm to marine mammals. Now, these apply not just to industry, not to ecotourism, but across the board. So that's recreational users as well as, you know, your general public out there, as well as any tourism industry. Restrictions around or any additional things with, tour, with ecotourism are, um, are then added on to that. So generally, when we look at having a new or a developing tourism industry, we develop wildlife management programs. And so these programs then set out very clearly what the key principles are that we're trying to deal with and the management strategies that we're going to be used to managing those. And these contain a whole range of things from licenses, specific interaction protocols, very clear messaging around research and monitoring, education and compliance. And that whole package together should develop a best practice system and framework that we can then use to, um, to be managing the ecotourism activity. 
Again, one of the important things in there is to make sure that we are working together with our other stakeholders and that we recognize that these documents and these management programs are a work in progress. So we should be learning and adjusting as we go, as the, as the industry develops, as we learn more about the animals and we see how the interactions occur, we should be prepared to be able to keep adjusting those as we go. So the basic principles for management kind of get back to what we talked about when we were saying what are the things that we need to manage and that's about managing the impacts to the animals the risk to the people ensuring there's a sustainable and viable industry and of course making sure that it's all informed and underpinned by science so that we can continue to have an adaptive process okay so i'm going to kind of run through the in-water humpback whale interaction tours just as a bit of an example to show you kind of exactly how the management strategies are put in place and some of the kind of rules that we have used along the line. And then I'll talk a bit more about the research and monitoring and, um, and education and compliance components. So humpback whale inter in water interactions were introduced by the former Minister of Environment back in 2015. And the industry began as a trial in 2016 and then spent several years as a trial while we developed the protocols and what the management strategies and has become a uh, permanent license industry uh, in the last year. So what do we do with our in-water interactions with whales? Well, we decided in this management program that we would have licenses. So the, um, the all tour operators are licensed. This means that we could put a limit on the number of um, licensed operators out there. There are currently 15 licenses for in-water interactions with whales. They can only occur in Ningaloo Marine Park, and 12 of the licenses operate in the northern end of um, Ningaloo Marine Park near Exmouth, and three licenses can operate out of Coral Bay. So that's some of the ways that we put some restrictions around spatially where things are happening and how much of it can occur out there. We then have specific conditions on those licenses, which are based around how the operators and swimmers should be interacting with the whales, and I'll talk about them a little bit more in the interaction protocol bit. And the other um, useful thing with having the license is that the tour operators do have to pay for the license and there's a there's a levy on every participant in the program and the, where that levy where that money goes to is into a fund that's used to fund re any research and monitoring on the activity and the whale shark officer who helps um, kind of oversee and manage the activity. So it's just a way of making sure that there is going to be information that's gained from it and that there is um, things that are going back towards conservation. Now, in terms of the interaction protocols, and again, these were developed based on available science, based on discussion with the tour operators and working with the tour operators, especially in the first couple of years to make sure we were getting it right and we had things that were actually workable out on the water. So the kind of things that we look at in terms of um, the interaction stuff is the approach limit. So uh, the in-water interaction can can approach closer than our current you know regulation under the our current legislation they can approach to within 75 meters on this from the side of the whales and 150 meters in front and so this is how they there's a couple different ways that they approach to put people in the water for resting and resting whales they'll come in from the side and put people in the water on the side then people still have to swim closer because a swimmer can get to within 30 meters so they're going to have to cover that last you know 30 40 meters themselves or alternatively for traveling whales the boats will drop people off in front of the whales 100 at least 150 meters away and then the whales will will swim past them and hopefully the people will have a chance to have a have a look as they go by some of the other things that we do restrict um or you know uh, uh, manage for the in-water interactions are having a time limit on how long each vessel can spend with a group of whales. They cannot be there for more than 60 minutes. Only one vessel can be in that interaction zone at a time so that the whales will not feel like they're being um, crowded. And uh, we've also put in a, um, a rule around no swimming, swimming with calves. Now, calves, and for this purpose, are defined as an animal that's half less or less than half the size of the mother. So if it's a small calf, less than half the size of the mother, no in-water interaction is allowed. For older calves towards the end of the season, then, um, then in-water actions are allowed. So the operators have to be very clear on being able to identify how big the calves are. All operators receive training in all of these uh, different protocols and regulations at the beginning of the season. 
Okay, now one of the other clear um, parts of the management programs is research and monitoring. We make sure that we write a, there's a specific section in the, the marine management programs about um, what what information we know about the species, what how what our general understanding is, and what we see the gaps in information that's needed to to learn to be able to continue to manage the industry. So some of the key important things that we would like to know is have a very good understanding of the species biology, their distribution, and their abundance. So basically, how they're using already using the area where we're hoping for the interactions to occur. We also want to be able to have some research or a good understanding of what kind of impacts these, the, both the boats and the in-water interactions might have on the on the whales. And then we also want to be able to assess the effectiveness of the interaction protocols that we've put in place. You know, so in terms of how the vessels approach, how people are put in the water, the length of time, we just want to make sure that what we're doing is actually minimizing those impacts and actually having it having some kind of effect. And finally, we also want to have a good understanding of visitor satisfaction. So we do put some effort into understanding people's perception of their experience, if it's a good experience, and if there are things that could improve it. We use this information to make sure um, that the management strategies are appropriate, and if we need to change them, then we do. So some of the kind of research techniques that are used to be able to look answer some of those questions are things like aerial surveys can be used to look at animal distribution and behavior from a different perspective. We also use boat-based surveys to look at specific behavioral response, and that's those are very valuable, especially in assessing um, the, the actual protocols in place and whether they're appropriate. Um, we can do some biological sampling, things like getting genetic samples to look at population structure and uh, family groupings. And we do use tagging, especially on things like whale sharks, to look at both short and long range movements. So again, that's about understanding how they use that space. We know that Nigaloo Marine Park, where these interactions occur, is certainly not the only area where they are. Both whale sharks and humpback whales are um, have long range migratory movements. So this this area is only a small part of where they spend their time. And finally, photo identification is often used in particular with whale sharks because we can, with different methodologies, we can identify individuals and then we can get kind of like a sighting history of them. So we know how often they might return to the marine park. We also know how many times they are interacted with and, you know, over, over what range of their life. So you can kind of get an understanding of is one animal the one that's always being impacted or, you know, if one's impacted this year or interacted with this year, they then don't come back. So you just learn a little bit more about population and, and how um, these kind of interactions fit into the whole lifespan of an animal. Uh, one of the other ways we collect data is actually from the operators themselves. They have an electronic management system on their vessels, which is just this little kind of GPS-based logbook system, which logs exactly where their location is, and then they enter information in it when they have an interaction. So from this, we get things about the number of tours that happen each year by each operator, the number of swimmers that are involved, exactly where the interactions occur, and the success of these interactions. And so we can use this kind of information to help us evaluate the industry and how it's and how it's operating. And finally, the uh, whale shark tour operators also do take these um, photographs for us. Every whale shark that they interact with, they photograph, and this information can be used in an international catalog of um, whale shark photo ID. And again, as I mentioned before, this information is really val valuable. If we can recognize an individual, we get a feeling for their sighting history, where they're seen here, as well as because this is an international catalog, these animals sometimes are picked up in other places around the world too. So it's just ways that we learn more about the life of the whale sharks as well. So I'm just going to give you one little quick example of one of the studies that we undertook because it was one that we used to help us adjust our management scheme. So humpback whales, we were very interested in their distribution and use of Ningaloo Marine Park uh, in, in order to make sure that we were seeing how they use the marine park and if that would change when the tourism activity was underway. And also just to understand the, the groups and the um, kind of dynamics in the, in the marine park. Now, what we found, we did this through aerial surveys. So we ran aerial surveys once a week throughout the um, throughout the season and across the whole marine park. That's, so that's the map is of, of um, uh, the peninsula and that's the, the dark blue line is the marine park um, boundary and the, yeah, the hatched line, yes, is, the, is our marine park state waters. 
Now, what we found was that there were um, humpback whales throughout the marine park. However, where the mothers and calves seemed to mainly be spending their time was right along the back of the reef. Now, as I mentioned before, we were a bit concerned about calves, especially young calves, because we do feel that they're one of the more vulnerable cohorts and the ones that we didn't really want to see interactions happening with, with those young animals. So we use that information and we created a mother calf protection zone. So now that pinky area is the mother calf protection zone. And it's basically the one within one kilometer of the of the Ningaloo, the actual reef, which is where the mothers and calves were spending their time. So in water interactions can only occur in the mother calf protection zone if the tour operator can guarantee that there is no calf present. For the humpback whales, they tend to use a spotter airplane, so they've got a very good over aerial view of um, of what's happening in the water, and they can pretty they can be able to see uh, when there's a calf present, and then they know they can interact with those animals. Okay, so moving on from uh, monitoring and research, one of the other key components of a management program is education, and this is about promoting the public awareness and appreciation and, of course, support for conservation and the different management strategies that are being used. So we do a whole range of things like community type activities with like Ningalulu as our um, lovely whale shark there. We also do a range of different types of presentations, both at, at a local level as, as well as more broadly. And the um, tour operators receive training every year in the different activities, in any new information that we have, and just to make sure that we have that education and information out there. And finally, ooh, okay, sorry about that. And finally, the last component of um, the management program is also looking at compliance. So we just have to make sure that people are doing the right thing out there as well. And we do this through, through things throughout the season, uh, having vessel inspections, running patrols so that people know that um, DBCA is still is making sure that things are happening correctly. And we also do covert operations as well. And so these are all ways just to make sure that everything is happening the way that it should and that we can um, you know, be doing the right thing on the water. So the final thing in a management program is being able to evaluate and adapt. So we have annual reporting every year where we look at the industry and how the industry has gone and any new information that we have added as well. And uh, we also undertake regular reviews. So say every three to five years, we might look at all of the science and information that's been gained in that time. We might be looking across, are there any new trends or emerging issues over that time? We do this through collecting the information ourselves, analyzing the data we have, and also discussing with all of our stakeholders. So we would include the tour operators in these kind of discussions as well, so that we everyone together has a shared understanding of what's happening, can bring their own issues to the table, and we can work together through that adaptive management process to make sure if there are changes that need to be made so that we are doing a better job out there, that we can do it together. So really, you know, that kind of brings it all to me, ties it all up with um, what we're doing in ecotourism and, and how we try and manage it. And again, you know, we it is a shared process. We all have the same goals and wanting a healthy, healthy wildlife populations, good positive experiences for people and something that's going to go on into the future because it's going to be a benefit for all of us. And I think that really um, wraps it up to me for how we see ecotourism, how we see we need to manage it, and making sure that, again, it, it, it's working for everyone, both the whales, the people, and, um, and the businesses. Okay, so I think that about does it for me. Do you guys have any questions? Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Yeah, um, we've got a couple of questions here. Um, Lily, I think you're, you've got a question there. Uh, yeah. um, whale sharks that in blue are mainly juvenile males. Do we know why this is? Um, that's a very good question. No, we don't. If only I was a whale shark scientist. So there's been there have been a number of people that have been looking into whale sharks, um, both at Ningaloo and then some of the other areas around the Indo-Pacific. So the whale shark population, they they use that whole Indo-Pacific area, not just Ningaloo. So you're right. It's a Ningaloo is an aggregation site mainly for males and juveniles. Why it's an aggregation site? We know that they come there because it's a good food source. Why it's that part of the of the um, population that that you know that you know de demographic structure, we're not really sure yet. And where where the other animals are, like where the you know adult females, where are some of those other um, 
parts of the population spending their time. We do know they're, they again they go up to the Indonesia as well, um, based on some of the satellite tracking. But it's a good, it's you know one that we would continue to explore. So to be honest, in my in the that wildlife management program that I showed you, that would be one of the questions in the research and monitoring section of it. On that, um, because they are uh, sharks and don't need a surface, is it a lot easier to research and monitor the whales um, using, you know, tags and things like that because they constantly are surfacing as opposed to whale sharks that could just, you know, spend all their time in a unknown deep location somewhere in the Indian Ocean? Yeah, so so that's exactly why you have that those range of different. I think that's why I put in those the range of different research techniques. I should um, quit sharing my screen, if only I could figure out how. There we go. Ah. Um, yeah, that's one of the reasons that I was showing you those different kind of research techniques that we use. So you kind of use the techniques that work best for that species. So tagging is actually really good for whale sharks because you're right. You don't see them as much from the surface. They're harder to find. So to be able to really track their movement and find what's going on, you need you need something else. So um, they do use satellite tags and these things called daily diaries, which record a lot more information from the whale sharks and even doing the photo ID so that you can see. Again, we know they're seen here. We know they've been seen in Indonesia. Indonesia and some of the other places where people are also doing photo ID. Whales are a bit different because they do have to surface to breathe. So it's a lot, in some ways, it's a lot easier to find them out there, right, as well. Like you can do boat-based activities and boat-based research, which might, which might not work um, quite as well with whale sharks if you don't know where they're going to be. Thank you. Uh, anyone else have a question? Uh, uh, recently, pilot whales beached themselves and couldn't be rescued. Are we any closer to understanding why they do this, or if there's any way we can, or if there's anything we can do to save them? So that's another really good question. Um, the theories around why animals strand have been around for for quite some time. It is something that we really don't understand, and we are still always working on. So there's a few different theories. Number one is that, in, in particular, something like pilot whales, the animals that mass strand, so they strand in these large groups, they have a really tight social structure. They live in they live in family groups. They're mainly based around matrilines, so it's like kind of the mothers and the grandmothers are the basic structure um, of the group, but they are in these large and very permanent groups. And when something goes wrong within the group, they stick together no matter what, which is often why we feel like they can all end up on a beach. There might just be one sick or injured or something wrong with an animal, but if they're all heading into trouble, they just go together and you can't, the animals that are on the beach with their group, they won't leave their group behind. So even when you have a stranding situation where you can rescue some because they're perfectly healthy and put them back in the water, they will still swim stri straight back into the beach. So it's been an, you know, an, an ongoing issue and one that we've grappled with and, and tried to understand for some time. We always try and collect as much information from a stranding situation as we can to understand the species, um, to understand the, the local circumstances of where the stranding took place and to see what we can learn to make sure there's not specific health issues or disturbance issues out on the water that might have affected the animals to um, to send them inshore anyway. So it's I you know sad to say it's an ongoing learning experience. And no, we don't really have any definitive answers yet. We just keep trying to do the best that we can with each situation as it occurs. Um, I. I had heard, you know, from ongoing, you know, strandings and things like that, that they around the world have thought that naval operations and underwater noise pollution could have been a cause, initial cause for the stranding. Is that still a, you know, a, an area of uh, concern or are they thinking more like you said, there's a, a leader of the pack is kind of put off or sick or something and, and, and that's how they all kind of come astray. 
So, you know, it's kind of it's kind of like many things like there's those are all different theories and it's not to be like every single stranding happens this in the same way. Right. So underwater noise is definitely one of the main pressures for marine mammals because they use their um, their acoustics and sound. That, that's how they communicate with each other. That's how they navigate. That's how they forage. So so their kind of acoustic world is really important to them. So adding uh, um, sounds into their environment, we do think that's one of the biggest um, pressures and threats on them. So that is still an, an, an existing one. Whether that's something that can cause them to strand, there's been evidence or theories around that in, in some particular areas with some particular species. The things like with pilot whales and um, false killer whales are one of the other ones that, that strand in large groups. They're the ones with very strong social dynamics and that, that will often stay together. But you know, that's that's I'm not explaining this very well. It can be there's different theories. It can be very situation specific, and there's no like one thing that explains everything. So we do any time a stranding occurs. That's what I was saying when we try and collect information and, and understand it better. We try and rule out some of those things. So so the recent one with the pilot whale stranding. We've collected some information, including getting some samples, as in some physical samples from the animal, so that we're going to actually uh, test them, run and run a CT scan on some of the pilot whale heads to make sure that they there isn't any evidence of like um, damage to their ears and ear canals. So that we want to rule out any kind of noise damage or noise or noise influence. We don't actually think that was a problem, but you want to rule out these things as well as 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 look at other causes. Thank you. Uh, anyone else? Are, are people allowed to swim with humpback, humpback whales recreationally, or do you have to have a commercial license? So this is where you get back to those minimum approach distances that are in our regulations. So the the actual legislation is that you cannot go in the water closer than 100 meters to a humpback whale. That's and that that's that's recreational. That's everybody. The um, the tour operators have ha, can go within that just based on the, the legislation they have. So it's not to say that you can't swim with a humpback whale, but you personally can't swim closer than a certain distance. A whale can approach you and that's perfectly fine, but you can't technically approach it. So do the distances apply, like, is it the same distances recreationally as it is commercially, um, or are they just like commercial operator rules? No, the commercial operators are allowed to uh, to take their vessels um, closer than than people are allowed to go. Then then a recreational person is allowed to take a vessel to basically get people into the water safely at a at a suitable distance. But a uh, a recreational vessel cannot go closer than 100 meters. <laughs>